Um, I'm just sitting on the floor so that if the puppies wake up and they want me, they're not gonna jump up and knock over my dry closet, which, you know, these days, these are the things you have to watch out for. I hope you enjoy this vlog. Right, Nola? Do we hope they enjoy this vlog? Nola. Oh my God, Nola. Here, no. You can't eat books. I'm telling you, it's like non-stop. He's so cute and everything, but he is a lot of work. It's Jess, and this is Nola. Want to say hi, Nola? Oh, he's still nipping. Nola's so little. We're gonna play the ball, but he's still nipping. and Nola and my other girl Fifi you see her around here my older dog Fifi do a reading vlog today this weekend he's still doing a lot of nipping because he's teething so he does a lot of as you can see he's nipping at me <laughs> and he doesn't do this all the time but we're working on getting him to stop nipping at our heels so we're doing some obedience training in the house. It's way too cold to go outside right now. We're gonna have to wait a couple more weeks before we can start taking him out. Ah, uh, can you sit for me, Nola? Good boy, good boy. So I'm gonna be talking like that a bit in our in this vlog because that's how you talk to dogs. Nola was born on November 26th. That is a little card right here. So yeah. He and my other dog are still working things out as well, so you might hear some barking. She's been disciplining the puppy, uh, just letting him know what her boundaries are. So sometimes she has to bark at him because he gets really overexcited. But we're teaching him how to mouth but not bite. <laughs> and we're teaching him how to fetch a ball. We're teaching him some commands. The commands that he's learning are off. So he's still learning that one. And he knows sit. So far he knows how to sit and come. He knows how to come when called. So yeah, pretty guaranteed that it's gonna be a pretty chaotic vlog. Oh, and I guess I should tell you guys what I'm gonna be reading for this vlog. I might actually wait till the dog's a little bit calmer and then I'll tell you guys what I'm reading for the vlog. Let me just show you how he can sit. No, let come. Can you sit for me? <gasps> Who's a good boy knows how to sit? Good boy. Good boy, sit. Good boy knows how to sit. That's my boy. Good boy. Welcome to a crazy reading vlog. Well, I guess I can go in the other room and show you guys what I'm reading. I think he might play on his own. Let's see what happens. If I sit on the floor, I'm going to get attacked by the dog. But that's okay. He's cute. So, here are the books that I'm going to read. Assuming I have time to read. We're gonna do some training, we're gonna do some playing. He sleeps quite a bit. He's really good at night. He sleeps almost the whole night through 
Sometimes he cries a little bit, but he doesn't bark and he doesn't whine. He's actually a really good dog considering that he's only, only eight weeks old. He's really cute, but he's a lot of work. Sorry if I'm making anyone dizzy with my camera work. So I thought in honor of our adoption of granola that I would read, and this was on my TBR for February. So I started in on Virginia Woolf's Flesh. This is a shorter uh, story about a Cocker Spaniel named Flesh. It's gifted to Elizabeth uh, Barrett and it's about, it's written from the dog's perspective and it's about the courtship between, between her and Robert Browning. And it's written from the perspective of Flush, the dog. <laughs> so I started it this morning. I'm about 50 pages in and it's really good. I mean, it's Virginia Woolf. So of course it's really well written. But so far what's happened is that Elizabeth Barrett is ill. So she's convalescing and staying in her room and the dog is staying with her and the dog is very attached to her. And then Mr. Browning starts showing up for visits and Flesh observes some changes in behavior and demeanor and he gets really jealous. <laughs> so in the first few pages, what we have is the dog being very jealous of Mr. Browning, uh, unable to control himself. He does attack Mr. Browning on a couple of different occasions. It's really interesting because Virginia Woolf is writing it from the perspective of the dogs as if the dog was human like giving but the emotions that she attributes to flesh are more intense than human emotions in a certain way um, because he's an animal so i'll just read to you this passage so this is the first attack okay so i'm just going to start from uh, when mr browning is visiting and, and flesh is having a really hard time with it so it's written from the dog's perspective so, so from Flesh's perspective, if only Mr. Barrett could hear the tone in which she welcomed this usurper, Mr. Barrett, Mr. Browning. Uh, Mr. Barrett is uh, Elizabeth Barrett's father. So from Flesh's perspective, if only Mr. Barrett could hear the tone in which she welcomed this usurper, the laugh with which she greeted him, the explanation, exclamation with which he took her hand in his. But nobody was in the room with them except Flesh. To him, the change was of the most galling nature. It was not merely that, merely that Miss Barrett was changing towards Mr. Browning. She was changing in every relation in her feeling towards Flesh himself. She treated his advances more briskly. She cut short his endearments laughingly. She made him feel that there was something petty, silly, affected in his old affectionate ways. His vanity was exacerbated. <laughs> his jealousy was inflamed. At last, when July came, he determined to make one violent attempt to regain her favor and perhaps to oust the newcomer. How to accomplish this double purpose he did not know and could not plan. But suddenly, on the 8th of July, his feelings overcame him. He flung himself on Mr. Browning and bit him savagely. At last, his teeth met in the immaculate cloth of Mr. Browning's trousers. But the limb inside was hard as iron. Mr. Kenyon's leg had been butter in comparison. Mr. Browning brushed him off with a flick of his hand and went on talking. Neither he nor Miss Barrett seemed to think the attack worthy of attention. Completely foiled, worsted, without a shaft left in his sheath, Flush sank back on his cushions, panting with rage and disappointment. But he had misjudged, panting with rage and disappointment. I mean, it's adorable. It's so adorable. It's so good so far. I'm sure it's going to be fantastic in its little one. So it'll be, it'll be a, a quick, I think it'll be a quick and very enjoyable read. And then the other book that I'm going to be reading for this reading vlog is Perfume by Patrick Suskind. Uh, I also think this is going to go really quickly. I read this, this is a reread for me, but I read this when I was in high school. So it's unlikely that I'll really remember it. I get, I remember the gist of it. This is about a man who's a perfumer and he concocts different fragrances it's because he has this incomparable, incomparable sense of smell. And along the way, he, because of his ambition, he has this ambition to create like the best perfume you can possibly make. But along the way, this 
request leads him to commit murder. So I haven't started perfume yet. I'm going to start it today and I will give you guys an update. We'll also show you us playing with the puppy and all kinds of footage of little puppy. I think I'm going to make some cookies and offer them to my neighbors because they have probably been hearing more barking in our household than we normally have. Don't we? Don't bite me. Let's bite a toy instead. I've never had a puppy this young before. My other dog, Fifi, was, she was three months when I got her. So I'm not used to this teething phase. I'm not used to that one. So let's see how it goes. Talk to you soon. Welcome to the vlog. Okay, this band-aid is not from getting bit by the dog. It's because I broke my nail. Yeah, so this is not from being bitten. I broke my nail and I'm heading to the manicurist this afternoon to get my nails done as well. So I'll keep you posted. I hope you're having a great day. Happy Friday. Talk soon. You're sleeping, little buddy. Are you sleeping? Are you having good dreams, little buddy? Good boy, good boy, good boy, sleepy. Little sleepy head. Little sleepy boy. Hi, just checking in. I have Nola here with me. He just woke up. It's kind of nap time around here. And he's really being nice and quiet. So I'm going to let him... But I'm being nice and quiet. I managed to have a shower. Um, and I've done some reading. So this is just delightful. I already, uh, sorry, the sun's a bit uh, in my face, in our faces. Blush. Oh, this is so cute, this addition too. Look, the inside cover has little paws. Isn't that so cute? We're at the point where he's just been stolen. So that's exciting. He, yeah, he's mad and jealous about this growing relationship. And his mistress has just taken him out for walks through London. And he's been stolen. So that's the point where we are in uh, Flush. And I spent a bit of time reading Perfume. I have to say the opening line of this book is pretty great. The opening line of Perfume is, in 18th century France, there lived a man who was one of the most gifted and abominable personages in an era that knew no lack of gifted and abominable, that's a hard word to say, and abominable personages. His story will be told here. That's pretty good. So far, we've been introduced to our main character, our abominable character, gifted and abominable character, Jean-Baptiste Grenouille. It's a very French name. It's set in Paris. And he's an orphaned boy who has an incredibly strong sense of smell. It's described as being that they make a comparison to music. I'll just read that description. Perhaps the closest analogy to his talent is the musical wonder kid who has heard his way inside melodies and harmonies to the alphabet of individual tones and now composes completely new melodies and harmonies all on his own. With the one difference, however, that the alphabet, of o the alphabet of odors is incomparably larger and more nuanced than that of tones. And with the additional difference that the creative activity of Renoué, the wonder kid, took place only inside him and could be perceived by no other than himself. So that it's been it's been pretty interesting. He is not well liked. He's definitely othered in the first part of the story. He's compared to a tick, so perhaps not so human, not so natural a being. And I'm up to chapter 11, uh, where we're meeting this perfumer, Baldini. Uh, he has a little perfume shop in Paris. And just previous to this, he, our main character, Grenouille, has murdered a girl because he wants her scent. He hasn't smelt anything like that before and he wants her scent. So I'm not really sure why he has to kill her to get her scent, but I think 
that's going to get explained, or I hope that's going to get explained. So yeah, so far, very readable. So far, so good. I'll keep you guys updated. I'm going to have to go get my nail fixed, and um, I'm going to go buy some eggs so I can make some cookies. And little Nola here is just going to keep on sleeping. Hey, little buddy. Hey, little buddy. Probably not going to update you guys again today. I'll probably update you guys tomorrow. So, Hi, everyone. How's it going? Sorry for the strange angle. I'm just down here on the floor with my puppy. And where are my glasses? Oh, boy. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. A lot of time down on the floor these days. Um, so yeah, I wanted to talk about flesh because I finished flesh and it was so good, everyone. Flesh was so good. Can I just say, what a great, <laughs> what a great story. Uh, what do I want to say about it? I mean, it's a little bit sad at the end. It's not at all what I expected. I thought, so I thought it was going to be more about the courtship between Robert Browning and Elizabeth Barrett Browning, but it's really about Flesh the dog. It really is an autobiography of the dog, believe it or not. And so that makes it really interesting. And I do sense a theme here where I'm reading perfume because a lot of time is spent talking about smells in this story. And in fact, I marked one of the spots where Flesh is talking about his sense of smell. So I don't want to give too much of the plot away. Flesh does get stolen. He does get retrieved. I guess I'll give up that part. But also he moves. So it does tell the light, the sort of the story of Elizabeth Barrett Browning in part because he's her dog. So he's very attached to her and the things that she does. And he goes along with her wherever she goes. They go from England to Italy. And this is a scene where just describing how the dog experiences his life through the smells of the city. So he says, but Flush, Mr. Browning wrote regularly in one room, Mrs. Browning wrote regularly in another, the baby played in the nursery, but Flush wandered off into the streets of Florence to enjoy the rapture of smell. He threaded his path through main streets and back streets, through squares and alleys by smell. He nosed his way from smell to smell, the rough, the smooth, the dark, the golden. He went in and out, up and down, where they beat brass, where they bake bread, where the women sit combing their hair, where the bird cages are piled high on the causeway, where the wine spills itself in dark red stains on the pavement, where leather smells and harness and garlic, where, where cloth is beaten, where vine leaves tremble, where men sit and drink and spit and dice. He ran in and out, always with his nose to the ground, drinking in the essence, or with his nose in the air, vibrating with the aroma. And earlier, in that earlier, in that same passage, in an earlier part, it says, yet it was in the world of smell that flesh mostly lived. Love was chiefly smell. Form and color were smell. <laughs> Nola, here's your toy. Uh, form and color were smell. Music and architecture, law, politics and science were smell. To him, religion itself was smell. So I noticed there's a theme going on between this story and perfume. Yeah, a lot of commentary here in this book on society. In particular, when flesh gets stolen, there's a big discussion about the value of, and I think this is, you know, where it reminds me a little bit of Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead and potentially Crime and Punishment, which I'm about to read. But there is this question of getting flesh back after he's been stolen and whether they should pay the ransom. Sorry, I'm gonna be giving some of it away, but whether they should pay the ransom to the people who stole flesh or not. And Elizabeth Barrett, Miss, Miss Barrett really wants to pay the ransom and get her dog back and she's very committed to it. But all of the society around her is saying not to. And her argument is, well, if it was me who had been stolen and they were threatening to cut off my ears, would you pay for me to come back? 
And so there's that question of like the value of life versus of the value of a human life versus the value of an animal's life. So that's raised. There's a couple of other things raised in, in here as well, but I'll leave it at that for now. I might say more in my wrap up for the month. So much fun. Such a great little story. I really, really enjoyed this one. So now back to perfume. How's it going? Well, I got a little tired last night. These days I've been getting a little tired in the evenings. Um, I think the puppy just wears me out a bit. My lips are so dry. I think I've already complained about this in another video. I'm just putting on a little, I got a little baby, a baby tub of, ooh, just a little baby tub of the Laneige lip mask <laughs> nothing is sponsored <laughs> and the dogs have been tiring me out a bit my older dog is a little bit jealous of the younger dog so that's fun and a lot of the training that i'm doing with the younger dog involves uh rewarding with treats and so it's really <laughs> it's really something as soon as i teach the little one to sit and give him a treat the older dog comes around and is like where is my treat <laughs> So it's been a challenge to say the least, y'all, to say the least. Um, but I have managed to get some reading done. There, there are down, down moments, there's down period. I'm at part three. So about 165 pages in, I'm about 60% of the way. Uh, Perfume by uh, Patrick Siskind. So our main character, his name is Grenouille. So our main character Grenouille and Grenouille is frog in French. So he's definitely less than a mortal, less than a human, we should say. And he has a superior sense of smell. And he, when we last left him, when I was last giving you an update, he was, yes, our main character Grenouille is, yes, we just left him with Baldini, who is the perfumer who is really desperately trying to copy a famous perfume for his shop in Paris. It's called Amour and Psyche. Anyway, he's trying to copy this perfume and Renoy comes with a delivery and manages to convince him that he knows all there is to know about perfumes and scents and convinces him. And then they kind of start up this partnership where uh, Baldini is trying to basically well, Baldini is using Grenouille to make perfumes to sell in his shop. And Grenouille doesn't seem to mind because he feels that he's getting an education, that he's learning about how to formulate perfumes that he can only smell and isn't able to necessarily, you know, write a formula for. And Baldini is happy about that because he can then know, create a formula for the perfumes that he can then own. So that's kind of interesting copyright uh, <laughs> ideas there. Uh, but ultimately, Baldini dies. <laughs> I mean, Grenouille, uh, Chenier is another character who's um, uh, like, he's his sort of right hand man in the perfumery and he, they come back one evening and the whole building has sunk into has sunk into the river and him and his wife have died. It's very mysterious. And then Grenouille goes off, he leaves Paris and he was, he was kind of saying goodbye anyway to Baldini. He was moving on to other things and Baldini was letting him go on his way. And he goes to uh, like a mountainous region in France and hides in a cave. 
<laughs> for seven years. And really what he's trying to do is get away from human smells. He wants to be away from all the smells. He wants to only smell like the purity of the untouched mountain that hasn't been touched by humans. So he's definitely not human. Uh, and I think we are getting to the point where we're learning that he's anti-human, <laughs> like, like the Antichrist, I think, something like that. Like he's been compared to a spider, he's been compared to a tick, and he's called Konoe, which is a frog. So he's clearly subhuman. And he, at this point of the story, I almost gave up because I was like, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know what I don't know. I was just, I just wasn't sure what was happening and what it was all about. And it was, he was losing me a little bit with the story. And then this character, Grenouille, has a, a kind of a dream where he's suffocated by the human smell, I think. I don't know. He has a, yeah, he has like a, a nightmare and then he wakes up from the nightmare and then decides that he wants to go back into the world and he wants to uh, emulate human scent for himself. So I guess he wants to integrate, but he wants to integrate because he has a nefarious motive. Yeah, so I don't know, like, I think when I first read Perfume, I think I might have DNF'd it. I just got um, irritated by the description of all the smells. But he does talk about this retreat to the mountains and this is how it's described. So we know that he's not like other humans. His retreat is described as follows. So Siskin writes, we are familiar with people who seek out solitude, penitents, failures, saints, or prophets. They retreat to deserts, preferably, where they live on locusts and honey. Others, however, live in caves or cells or remote islands. Some, more spectacularly, squat in cages mounted high atop poles, swaying in the breeze. They do this to be, to be nearer God. Their solitude is a self-mortification by which they do penance. They act in the belief that they are living a life pleasing to God. Or they wait months, years for their solitude to be broken by some divine message that they hope then speedily to broadcast among mankind. Grenouille's case, however, was nothing of the sort. There was not the least notion of God in his head. He was not doing penance nor waiting for some supernatural inspiration. He had withdrawn solely for his own personal pleasure, only to be near to himself. No longer distracted by anything external, he basked in his own existence and found it splendid. He lay in his stony crypt like his own corpse, hardly breathing, his heart hardly beating, and yet lived as intensively, dissolutely as ever a rake had lived in the wide world outside. So this is the first time that we really, aside from knowing that he's not, he's a subhuman, this is the first time that we really start to see, oh yeah, he's definitely like the, he's like, the Antichrist, I think. So then he tries to see if he has his own smell, like if he has a human smell, he smells under his armpits and he, he realizes he has no human smell and he realizes that this is gonna be a problem for him and he really wants to emulate human smell. And I think he wants to emulate human smell ultimately because he wants to, he wants to have power. He wants to be able to move within society without people being um, scared of him or disgusted by him. So here's, an, here's the passage that, that indicates this. He knew he could, so he creates a scent. He, he, there's a story about how he leaves the mountain and he goes into the village and he says that he was attacked and the scientist takes him in and he, the scientist has a th whole theory, which I'm not going to get into right now because it, it sort of would be long, but basically he looks to Grenoy as a, he wants Grenoy to be an example of his experiment. Uh, that has to do with vanity and coming up from the earth and, and separating yourself from nature and becoming more refined as a way to achieve long life. Uh, so anyway, so he uses Grenoy as his uh, example of this and he, and Grenoy kind of 
work together and he becomes quite famous and again he dies <laughs> and Grinoy goes on like that's where we are at the end of part three but Anyway, I'll get to that in just a minute, but just back to this idea of getting the human scent. Uh, Grenouille makes a scent, uh, and he's trying to emulate the human scent. So he says he knew, he now knew that he could do much more. He knew that he could improve on this scent. He would be able to create a scent that was not merely human, but superhuman, an angel's scent. So indescribably good and vital that whoever smelled it would be enchanted with his whole heart would have to love him, Grenouille, the bearer of the scent. Yes, that was what he wanted. They would love him as they stood under the spell of his scent, not just accept him as, as one of them, but love him to the point of insanity, of self-abandonment. They would quiver with delight, scream, weep for bliss. They would sink to their knees just as if under God's cold incense, merely to be able to smell him, Grenouille, he would be the omnipotent god of scent, just as he had been in his fantasies, but this time in the real world and over real people. And he knew that all this was within his power. For people could close their eyes to greatness, to horrors, to beauty, and their ears to melodies or deceiving words, but they could not escape scent. For scent was a brother of breath. Together with breath, it entered human beings who could not defend themselves against it, not if they wanted to live. And scent entered into their very core, went directly to their hearts, and decided for good and all between affection and contempt, disgust and lust and love and hate. He who ruled scent ruled the hearts of men. So that's a little tip of where the book is going. <laughs> Again, uh, the people that he encounters along the way in the story, um, each of them has has died. The three men, and, and the woman, I think, well, no, the three men that he's encountered, encountered along the way in the story have died. And I guess that's open to interpretation, like why they died if he... Because they kind of use him... Um, anyhow, if anyone else has a right perfume and you have a theory about that, I'd love to hear it. And I'm going to try to uh, finish uh, perfume today. It's Sunday. I'm going to try to finish it today, but it will depend a little bit on the rascals. The rascal. And I have some other errands that I have to deal with today, take care of today. I was going to try to give the dog a bath. Does that sound ambitious? Probably it is. Hmm. All right. I think we can confirm that he is the Antichrist. He just killed a puppy for his scent. I didn't see this coming. I didn't know how upset I would get. Given that this is a, given that this is a vlog about me and my new puppy, I didn't realize how much it would hit. Even Nola's upset about it. Are you upset that they killed a puppy? Are you upset about it? Yes. He does smell good though. <laughs> All right. I don't know if we're going to give him a bath. We'll see. He killed a puppy just for his scent. He killed a puppy just for his scent. Yeah, and he made him be happy the whole time. He's evil. He's evil. He killed a puppy. Okay, I think I've made my point. And he says quite clearly when he kills the puppy, after he kills the puppy, he says something like, I captured his aromatic soul. Oh my goodness, what an evil guy. He says, Grenouille, Grenouille closed it up tight and put it in his back pocket and bore it with him for a long time as a souvenir of his day of triumph. When for the first time he had succeeded in robbing a living creature of its aromatic soul. <gasps> Nola, what do you think about that, buddy? What do you have to say? Are you going to eat the book? I think that's an appropriate reaction. I think that's an appropriate reaction to this. All right. I'm going to keep reading. But man, oh, that is just so disturbing. That's disturbing. I mean, I don't know why I'm more disturbed about that than when he kills a person, but you know, puppies, helpless little creatures, really. They can be rascals. They can be annoying, 
but they're helpless little guys. Aren't you, buddy? You're helpless. Are you a helpless little guy? Can you not bite me? Oh, no biting. Oh, is somebody getting some little dummy rubs? Oh, good boy. Good boy. Off. Good boy. Get the book instead. Okay, everyone. So I don't know how this is going to go, but I'm going to try to give Granola a bath. I hope that he's okay. He's already whining at me, and I hope that he's okay. He really needs a bath. He stinks. So we're going to give it a go. Wish me luck. You go boy. It's not torturing a dog to take care of it and bathe it, right? Right, honey. Okay. What do you think about water? Do you like him? What do you think about water? Let's see. Are you curious? He's already curious about everything around. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh no, he doesn't like that. Oh, you're being so good, Nona. What a good boy. What a good boy. Just a curious little boy, huh? Here, it's okay. I got you. I got you, buddy. He's actually doing great. I'm so impressed with you. I know you don't love it. I love you. You're doing a great job. Oh, he's a good boy. Who's a good boy, Nola? Good job. I think you did a great job. You did great. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you, little buddy. Now you're going to be all clean. He really, really needed, he really needed a bath. I would say that was a success. A little awkward filming, but a success nonetheless. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy, Nola. Good boy. You're so wet. You're so wet. We need another towel. Was that your first bath? Was that your first bath? Was that your first bath, buddy? I think it might have been. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. That one's for Fifi. Hi, everyone. It's me. I'm back. I'm in the same spot, but I'm not sitting on the floor this time because otherwise I'll get mauled to death. Nola, do you want to come up and say hi? You're being a little bit of a brat today. He's not being a brat. He's just very curious. Very curious. You're very curious. Do you want to sit with me? Are we going to talk about perfume? Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to come back on and finish off the vlog. It's been super fun doing this one with the puppy and just let you guys know my final thoughts on, let everyone know my final thoughts on perfume. Okay, he's nicely distracted now. So perfume, wow. How do I, how do I end this vlog without giving any more spoilers than I already have? Perhaps it's impossible. Let me just say, it's the story of a murderer. <laughs> it truly is the story of a murderer. I can't remember where we last off, where we last left off. Oh, I think I had not mentioned lore when we last left off. I was beginning part three or at the end of part three. I'm sorry, I can't recall. Uh, but... So Grenouille travels to an area of France called Grasse, which is where all of the wonderful scents that he'd heard about from Baldini are, are made. So he wanted to go there after he left his cave and after he <laughs> left the star, there's some barking, left the scientist. So he ends up going on, he makes this this perfume to make himself seem more human. I think that was where we ended up. And he's worried, but he wants to make a perfume that makes him, um, makes humans like succumb to his will, right? So that's where we left off. And so he's gone to grass to try to figure out how he's going to do this. And... Fifi, did you just knock over your food bowl? It's chaos here with the dogs, I'm telling you. Well, how do I end this? Okay, well, I'll do a, I'll do a no spoilers ending. So yeah, the ending's really good. And then I'll do a spoilers ending. So he goes to Grass, uh, and I guess if you don't want any spoilers, maybe stop watching the video here and then skip ahead to all the cute puppy stuff. So yeah, he goes to Grass to try to make this perfume and he is successful, but he, 
he has to start murdering virgins, basically. <laughs> Which is very satanic, isn't it? Uh, so he kills, at first he's killing people who are maybe not as important. So there's a, there's kind of an interesting social commentary happening in Perfume, which I'm not going to do a dive into right now because I want to think about it a bit more. It would take quite a bit of time. But that definitely, absolutely, the first woman that he kills is like a, a peasant or I don't know if she's a Roman woman or an Italian woman, somebody who's working in the fields. Uh, so it isn't taken quite as seriously. And, uh, but he goes on to kill like 24, 24 women, right at the point of pre-pubescent women or post-pubescent -pu post women who are virgins still. You get what I mean. And the town kind of freaks out and is very, very worried because there's like a mass murderer amongst them. Uh, and then he goes off and he stops for a while. And it's funny because he ha he keeps their hair and he keeps their night dresses. <laughs> Odd. Uh, but he obviously just doesn't care. So, yeah, he's like a serial killer. I don't know. He has trophies. Uh, so, but then he encounters this woman, Lore, who's like the prettiest woman. And she's the daughter of this nobleman. He has to have her. And so, and I thought going into it that he wasn't going to be able to murder Lore and get her sent because the way that Siskin presents it, he presents it as though the father, and, and so Antoine Lachie, the nobleman, he seems to know that the murderer is going to come for his daughter and he tries to marry her off. And as they're escaping, uh, Grenouille uh, does go and kill Lore and take her scent but then of course he has the penultimate scent made and even though he gets arrested he gets found out he gets arrested At the time of his execution he lets out the scent on the bill on the population and everyone goes crazy <laughs> and they, there's like this Everyone's in bliss. Everyone's enthralled with him and the charges get dropped. And, but he's very dissatisfied in the end. Like he gets set free. And this man, Richie, even though he killed Laura, his daughter, asks him to be his son. I mean, he has done this whole, put this veil over everyone and everyone's in love with him through the scent that he's created. But he's really dissatisfied. Like, he doesn't, this isn't satisfactory to him because ultimately what Grenouille wants is to be human. He's not human, and what we discover is that what he really wants is to be human. So he talks about sort of what he could do. He could have everybody sort of serving him and bowing down to him, and he's, so Suskind so writes, he could do all that if only he wanted to. He possessed the power. He held it in his hand, a power stronger than the power of money or the power of terror or the power of death the invincible power to command the love of mankind. There was only one thing that power could not do. It could not make him able to smell himself. So, you know, he has no scent. And so the representation of him having no scent is that he's not human. Uh, and that's above all what he wants. Uh, and though his perfume might allow him to appear before the world as a god, if he could not smell himself and thus never know who he was, to hell with it! with the world, with himself, with his perfume. So he's not happy with that. And there is more to the ending. So I guess this is kind of no spoilers, spoilers, end of the vlog. There's more to the ending, which I'm not going to comment on. But the ending ending, the real ending of what happens to Kunui is really good. It's really, really good. Did I love the book? I mean, I, I struggled a bit with the first half of this book and I remember struggling with it before and I think I DNF'd it when I was younger. I just didn't have the patience for it. I don't know why. Everybody talks about how much they love the prose and they love the writing and that's why they love the book. The story is really good and ultimately it becomes a really interesting story. I would say more so to, in the second half and towards the end when you start to figure out what's going on. But I don't know, it just, it dragged a little bit for me in the beginning. Oh, sorry, everyone. 
and that's uncommon for me. Uh, so I don't know what my problem was. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, anyway, I might need to think on it a little bit before I decide if I loved perfume or not. But I'm really glad I read it. It was a really, it was a really good read, and it was a pretty interesting story. And I think there were, that it had a lot to say, especially because Grenouille like really doesn't like other people. And I mean, he kind of has a point. I'm sorry for all the noise. <laughs> Nola is playing with his toy down here and he's making a lot of shuffling noises. But yeah, so Kronoi doesn't really like humans. And that's the other thing about conquering humans is that when he looks out at the group of people who are like, you know, bowing down to him, he's like, I don't even like these people. I don't even want them to worship me because I don't even like them. <laughs> So that's all pretty interesting. And then also, it, he really, Siskin really does show like just how horrible people are, particularly at the end when like the magistrates come back together after this big fin finale of Grenouille enchanting everybody. And they decide that they still have to prosecute someone for their murders. So they end up prosecuting the man that he was, that Grenouille was staying with because that's where they found the night nightgowns and everything under the floorboards. And they hang him. And he's like clearly an innocent man. So I think this commentary on just mankind, humankind being so despicable versus Grenouille being so despicable is a really interesting commentary. And Grenouille just despising humankind is, is sort of interesting too. But it's a paradox, right? Like I think, and, and Suskind really is pretty clear about the fact that this is a paradox. It's like the paradox that we live in. At one point he says, uh, in reference to Grenouille, if I can just find that before we go. I'm sorry, my dog is drinking water loudly. There's so much background noise in this, in this clip. I apologize. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to finish this. He really wants my attention. Okay, here we go. I know the buildup, the buildup for this quote. I, I don't know if anyone's still here for this. Uh, okay, so. Yeah, it's at the point where he managed to cast a spell over the crowd and and gets, as a result of it, is, is allowed to go free and everyone's worshipping him. And Siskin writes, Grenouille stood there and smiled, or rather it seemed to the people who saw him that he was smiling, the most innocent, loving, enchanting, and at the same time the most seductive smile in the world. But in fact, it was not a smile, but an ugly, cynical smirk that that lay upon his lips, reflecting both his total triumph and his total contempt. So yeah, he has this paradox, like he got what he wanted, he got everyone to love him, but he has such contempt for these people that he realizes that it's kind of empty. So anyway, yeah, a lot to think about, a lot to think about with this one. Yo, if you've read Perfume, then let me know your thoughts. I love to hear from others. Thanks for watching this vlog. I hope it was entertaining. I don't know how a puppy can not be entertaining. I can see how I could not be entertaining, but a puppy, everyone? So, yeah, thanks again for joining me in this little reading journey and this little puppy adoption process of bringing granola into our home and trying to get him acclimated and trying to get my other dog acclimated. It's been, it's been super fun. I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now. <laughs>